What's up, everyone? It's Elaine here with Neon Owl, connecting people through music, passion, and giving back. We really try to change how music media is done, um, taking it back to positivity, inspiration, good music, and getting to know the artists beyond the industry. So if you haven't checked us out yet, make sure you visit www.neonowl.co or check us out across Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at Neon Owl Co. Um, we do feature different interviews every single week, and every now and then we also live stream the interviews or certain events on our Periscope. So if you would like to follow us on Periscope, we are Neon Owl on there. We'd love to hear from you as far as what artists you'd like for us to interview next and maybe what questions you have for them. If you like these interviews, make sure you share them. Today, I'm really excited to share my interview with Cesare with you guys. He is a DJ and producer based out of the LA area, but currently traveling Italy. And he's such a positive guy with a great attitude. Um, I love this interview and I love what he had to say at the end about what he values and what he wants to leave behind. It was definitely an answer that I hadn't heard much of and I really, really connected with it. And make sure you check it out at the end because we I did put him on the spot and I had him do a little performance. Uh, he had no idea, but we had him singing and playing the guitar. So everyone, uh, Cesare. All right, so how's it going? It's going wonderfully. I can't <laughs> believe how amazing it's going right now. It's great. How are you? I am good. A little sick uh, in New York City right now. So if I'm sneezing, coughing, or taking a sip of tea, you know why. <laughs> See, now you got me wanting tea. <laughs> She's great. Um, so choice. before I get started, I always like to start with a positive focus. So something that you're either grateful for or excited about. Um, grateful for just everything that's going on in life right now. Um, excited about everything that's going on in my life right now. Um, it's it's really nice uh, for any artist, it doesn't matter what type of medium, to um, be really immersed in doing the things that you love to do, you know, things that like feed your soul. And um, I haven't had a job, mm -hmm. so to speak, or had to work for somebody else um, since June. So going on a couple solid months of just constant creativity and artist flow. So extremely, extremely happy about that. And a lot of positive, positive, you know, output and fortunately getting a lot back. So that's, yeah. that's definitely something I'm happy and excited about. Yeah. So tell us about where you're at right now. I know you're on a special journey. We want to know yes. about that. <laughs> um, I am actually in Turin, Italy. Um, locally and previously it was called Torino. Uh, originally it was the capital of Italy and then later became Rome, but um, Turin is also the home of uh, Fiat's. The Fiat, original Fiat factory was here and it's also where Nutella comes from, so, <laughs> right? Bring us back yeah. some. Is it is it extra oh, special or it's the same pretty much? <laughs> it, it tastes a little different. It does taste a little different, but um, I think that's because in Europe um, there's the use of GMOs is not allowed. It's not, yeah. it's banned. GMOs yeah. are banned. So everything tastes a little bit different. The fruit, the everything, the food, they don't use like pesticides and certain stuff. And so it's, the, the palate is a little bit off, but you know, everything is delicious. And the Nutella is used on everything. Mm -hmm. It's put in coffee. Oh my gosh. My favorite coffee is called a maracchino mm -hmm. and they put Nutella on the inside of the glass. And, uh, that sounds so amazing. <laughs> but yeah, so Turin, Turin, Italy is where I've been for the past, uh, this is day 31 of my um, 56 days in Italy, and I have the whole like hashtag 56 days in Italy thing going right now. So if you look that up, you can see um, I've tried to make a, a Instagram and like social media post every day on different things that I've been doing and working on. And uh, yeah, it's great. It's gorgeous. I've never been to Italy before. This is my first time here, so I've just been like culture shocked the entire time. Yeah. It's been really cool. Yeah, I've, I've been checking out the pictures. So do you pick your favorite picture of the day or how do you choose which one to post? <sighs> it's difficult because I previously, like, I mean, social media is a really important part of any um, artist or like brand's, you know, image. But previously I'd put up something on Instagram, maybe like 
once a week. You know, sometimes I hate Nubia every other week. And, um, you know, you'd see those 30 day Instagram challenges or whatever. People would be like, all right, this day I'm doing this, this day I'm doing that. And I would always look at it and be like, oh, yeah, that would be kind of cool to do. And I never did it. And, but, Finally, I like forced myself. I was like, "All right, for this trip, I have to like document it, and I really want to like main, uh, keep a lot of the memories and and share them with a lot of people because so many people were telling me, you know, that's going to be so amazing to have that much time in another country. Um, you know, we want to know all about it, so you have to like post a lot. So I've been trying to come up with new stuff every day, but you know, you can only take so many pictures of your coffee or of my pizzas or <laughs> of, be surprised. You know, <laughs> I, it's so funny like my pizza and my coffee posts are probably the ones that get the most likes and comments like it's it's kind of funny how it does that selfies are, aren't going over that great I don't know why I mean I don't know maybe I need to get a haircut or something I'm not sure but um, I, I love the architecture here the architecture is amazing it's um, it's just something that you don't see it's in the states um, you walk down the street here and there's, you know, cobblestones or like brick that's laid out on the sidewalk that's like the original brick from when the city was first built. And it's, uh, you could just like feel the sense of culture everywhere you look, everywhere you go. Um, you, you, you just, you feel the essence and the history. And it's really, really cool. It's uh, something I wasn't expecting. And um, it's been kind of surprising because, uh, you know, never having experienced anything like that in the States, everything you, you know, you walk down the streets of LA or San Diego mm -hmm. or something and you're like you know, big, tall glass buildings. They have big, tall glass buildings here too, but they're right next to like a little mom and pop corner shop, like where they're just, you know, selling bread and <laughs> yeah, you're like, jelly um... stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's very, it's very, uh, eclectic and culturally diverse. Yeah. And so what inspired you or triggered you to make that decision for this trip? Oh man, um, I well, I'm Italian. I, my father is uh, full-blooded Sicilian, and uh, my mom is like everything but Italian. So I, I grew up in a very uh, Italian-based cultural family. I was always at my grandparents' house. You know, they're the typical Italian. You know, my grandmother was you know small chubby, always making <laughs> pasta, always in the kitchen, you know, yelling at us in Italian. We didn't understand any Italian, but we knew when we were in trouble because, you know, she'd get louder and the hands started moving and stuff. <laughs> but, um, so I've, I've always wanted to see Italy. I've always wanted to um, experience kind of, you know, the culture that my background, my heritage, you know, where I came from and everything. And, um, my youngest sister, who's actually uh, 18, she always said that when she graduated high school, um, she wanted to move to Italy for a year. And uh, it wasn't until later that she found out you could only be in some of the allied um, countries for 90 days at a time. And then you have to be out of the country yeah. or surrounding countries um, for, I think, 90 days or six months or something like that. And then you can go back. So she changed her plans and uh, she saved up all of, like a whole bunch of money that she was working during high school. And she booked a flight and uh, things kind of just fell into place for me. Um, I uh, Every summer I teach up in a uh, arts a summer program um, called Idlewild Arts. It's actually also a um, what's it called? It's a boarding Idlewild Arts. There is a little uh, town up in the mountains near uh, Hemet, and it's kind of between um, Los Angeles and San Diego, up in the San Jacinto Mountains. Um, and uh, it used to be called Idlewild School of Music and the Arts. The acronym was ISAMADA. Uh, I went there as a kid. Um, during the summer program and took uh, musical theater, um, took band, ceramics, like all these different types of different art mediums. And I, I loved it. It like totally shaped me and like turned me into the performer that I ended up becoming uh, throughout my life. And so um, I went back as an adult and now I teach there during the summer. And so I had that job for a couple of weeks uh, this summer and um, I wasn't working for uh, my previous employer, who was uh, a film and movie producer, Jerry Weintraub. Um, I wasn't working for him anymore because uh, he unfortunately passed away. Mm -hmm. And so I found myself um, kind of at like 
an opportunity of, of crossroads. Uh, my apartment in Los Angeles, my lease was up in September and I had, I didn't necessarily have to leave. I could have stayed there if I wanted to, but yeah. I had nothing tying me down to one place. And um, oddly enough, I saw one of my friends post a, a little thing on Instagram and it, a little meme that was like, you know, if you can take an opportunity to travel, you should worry about the money later. And so Amen. I applied for, I applied for, I applied for like a Capital One venture credit card, and uh, I just booked a flight, and I made the returning date the same date that my baby sister is going to be going back to the states, and uh, I asked if she wanted, you know, a, a partner in crime on her <laughs> on her Italy adventure, and she flipped out and got excited, and so we have a little two bedroom apartment um, on the sixth floor of this awesome little unit, and. Yeah, we've just, you know, we explore the city pretty much every day, we just do random daily Italian stuff. <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. So has it been like one of the better decisions you've made, one of the best decisions? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I'll have to suffer with the consequences of having to pay off credit cards, like when I get back to the States and, you know, am working and all that stuff again. But for right now, it's... It's absolutely what I needed to kind of like reimmerse myself into working on music full time and just, you know, it's, it's interesting when you go to another country that speaks English and when you go to another country where it's like one in 15, 20 people might actually like be able to understand you a little bit. Um, culture shock is real. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's real strong in Italy. I was, I thought that there was going to be, um, a few more people that were gonna know in uh, English and I was gonna be able to communicate um, a, a little bit easier but yeah. there's not yeah. so I've been uh, I've been learning a little Italian and yeah. uh, I've, I've gotten good. You know, <laughs> I've been I've been I've been getting my coffee orders and my food orders down and just you know asking where things are and just simple simple conversational stuff but yeah absolutely a uh, one of the best decisions I've made as an adult yeah. <laughs> and so you know, you said you've been working on your music a lot. I know that you pretty much do it all <laughs> from dancing, acting, producing music. So tell us about all your skills <laughs> and how that came about. Um, well, I, I, music started when I was uh, a little, a little kid. My dad um, was a professional musician and a music teacher. And so he was always, you know, practicing at home with his bands and stuff. You know, I, I have, I'm sure my mom has pictures of me like asleep on the ground, like underneath my dad's drum set while he's playing drums. So it's like music and rhythm and all that was always just kind of like ingrained in me as a kid. Um, I started dancing at a very young age. I think I had my first dance performance when I was like one and a half. I, I'm pretty sure my mom has some old video of me doing like the hooky lao, like at a at a backyard Hawaiian like barbecue or something like that, a little background a backyard luau. But um, you know, I started. I became a studio kid, and uh, I took jazz, ballet, tap, hip hop. Um, tap and hip hop were things that I kind of like uh, focused a bit more on just because tap was very musically inclined. You had to make a lot of rhythms and sounds with your feet. And hip hop was, at the time, uh, what was becoming mainstream, like pop culture. Hip hop was like being shoved down, you know, mainstream media's throat as like, all right, cool, this is what mainstream music is now. And uh, so I obviously veered towards that more. And uh, when I was dancing as a kid, it was during a time when dance for male dancers was still um, very, it had a very negative stereotype about it. and. It all, you know, even with just homosexuality in general, um, it had a very negative stereotype about it. So growing up as a kid, taking hip hop was slightly more acceptable in society's eyes versus growing up as a male dancer taking ballet. Mm -hmm. um, I still took ballet because <laughs> you, you have to have the technique and stuff to excel in other styles. But um, I definitely got, you know, teased and bullied and ridiculed more for the more feminine style dancing but once they saw that i was you know busting out in hip-hop and i could break dance and stuff like that you know that got a little bit more respect so i kind of veered towards that a little bit more but i love them all i love dancing i love uh music uh, i started playing um 
piano when I was in kindergarten, um, stopped doing that, switched over to saxophone in fourth grade and got into jazz band and switched to drums. And I just kind of like started hopping around uh, the rhythm section, picked up guitar and bass. And um, now I play um, guitar, bass, drums, piano. Uh, I haven't played sax in a long time, but I still play a little bit of sax and then a little ukulele. So I play a couple different instruments. It's uh, it's nice to be well, well-rounded and, um, you know, enjoying dancing and music. It kind of got me into musical theater. When middle school, I started doing uh, doing shows and stuff for school, did a lot of, lot of plays and musicals and sang a lot, you know? So it's just kind of all <laughs> was tied together, all the little different branches, you know? I'm a, I, I like to, think of myself as kind of like one of those jack of all trades, master of none type of thing. <laughs> um, or, you know, more so a slightly ADD. I can't necessarily <laughs> say focus on one thing too long. I have to like have multiple interests. Otherwise I'll get bored with something. So in order to change it up and kind of like keep the creative flow going, um, if I start getting like stuck in a rut and working on one thing, I'll like switch over to a different style. And um, that actually happened recently. I was working on a remix and I just, I couldn't get anywhere else with it. So I just stopped working on it. I shelved it for like a couple of weeks and I started working on an acoustic cover. Um, and then I came back to it. And then all of a sudden something that I did in the acoustic cover triggered something and I was able to like finish the track and get the remix done. And you know, they're, they're completely different. One is a festival trap song and then the other is like an acoustic mashup. So. It's, uh, it's nice how they can all like connect and help each other out. Yeah. And so, well, first off, we're probably going to have you show us a little bit of, you know, something, something later or whatever that may be. <laughs> so just be prepared. Okay. Um, and secondly, of all the, the different things that you, you know, dabble into, which one would you say is your favorite? And then which one would you say you're the best at? <laughs> That's tough. Um... I don't really think I have a favorite. I mean, I've, I, I kind of have to force myself to thinking that music production, especially electronic music, is my favorite right now. It's the something. It's the thing that I need to um, spend a lot, of, uh, the most amount of time on. Um, but you know, I've been dancing. My, I don't know. I, I don't really have a favorite. <laughs> um, uh, and as far as the thing that I'm best at. That's that's really hard too, because um, in in a dancer's world, in a dancer's mind, I'm I'm getting up there as a kind of like age wise. <laughs> and, uh, as as you get older, I mean, a lot of professional dancers will say that you have like a ten year period that is like your prime as uh, as a professional dancer, and I I've, I've definitely exceeded that that ten year mark, and I'm uh, I guess. I guess you could say I'm a little bit over the hill when it comes to when it comes to dance. So uh, I've been doing it for so long, my body is starting to wear down and break down a bit. It takes a little bit longer to you know mm -hmm. warm up and get <laughs> mobile and stuff. And um, I definitely cannot do certain things that I used to do. I've, I haven't really break done any break dancing in a while, you know, for safety and smarter <laughs> reasons. <laughs> you know, I don't necessarily want to break anything, so I've veered away from that. But um, uh, I don't know. I've, I've, I've definitely felt that there has been a, an improvement in my music production, even in the last uh, two months, like over the summer and up into this last month of me being here in Italy. And it really just boils down to, you know, the thing that you're spending the most time on and the thing that you're committed to the most is going to be the thing that you excel in. You know, if you're committed and you're dedicated to something and you spend a lot of your time, not necessarily practicing, but in um, throwing yourself into it and um, uh, trying to better yourself, and then that's the thing that you're gonna get better at and you're gonna feel more confident in. And um, I've seen that a bit in, in my production in the last couple of months. Uh, um, I sent a track over to uh, one of my friends and mentors and, uh, I, I ask them for notes, you know, I always ask uh, two of my best friends for um, critiques anytime I'm working on a track and be like, you know, what is it? I feel like something is missing. Listen to it. Let me know what you yeah. think. And um, the only thing that my friend said with the uh, last remix that I sent him, he, he was like, this, this is easy, easily the best thing that you've produced uh, so far. And I was like, wow. okay, I wasn't, ex I wasn't <laughs> expecting that. that. That was really cool. 
I'm not saying that it's good, but it's the best thing that I've done so far. So the fact that there is progress is, you know, the most important thing. Change is constant. It's only good if, you know, it's in a positive in the right direction. Okay. Well, we're going to have to get a clip of that at some point. <laughs> um, um, I, I don't even know if there's a way to... I could probably send you a link after the call. Yeah, yeah after we can do it after, after the interview. And so as far as your musical influences, who would you say are some of the, the people that you really look up to or inspires you? Oh, man. Um, a lot of different ones. I mean, growing up, it was uh, it, different artists and stuff when, when I was younger. Um, Michael Jackson, huge, huge influence when I was growing up as a kid. Um, Prince, you know, I, I drew a lot of influences from, you know, stuff like Louis Armstrong, um, the Brian Setzer Orchestra, you know, I was very diverse in my uh, musical interests, so I pulled different inspirations from different uh, things and different people, but um, now in today's current music scene, um, I'd have to say the people that are doing everything that I want to do, um, number one would probably be Zed. He, uh, Zed's probably first off he's a musical genius like he's he's a savant like for sure he can do everything <laughs> you know he plays multiple instruments um when he came out with his uh drum cover of find you i was just like all right, mm -hmm. <laughs> all right this, this guy is just like this guy is the shit he can do everything and he's just amazing at everything that he does um the fact that he has his own music career as Zed, that he's a producer and he does festivals and shows and clubs and all that, tours the world, um, but also the fact that he is producing for like the hottest acts in pop mainstream music is is huge. Um, it's very difficult for EDM artists to cross over to mainstream. There have only been a few that have done it. You know, Calvin Harris, Zed, um, Skrillex and Diplo together as Jack Hugh, they've crossed yeah. over with uh, with Justin Bieber now. So um, the fact that he was one of the first to do it and the fact that he does it so well, uh, that is a huge, huge influence. But um, also uh, Cascade. Cascade was a massive, massive influence when I first started getting into um, electronic music. And uh, as ironic as it is, Tiesto, um, way back in the day when I was, when. <laughs> When underground, like, trance was, like, a majority of what you would hear, um, you know, I started listening to a lot of, uh, a lot of Tiesto when I first got into electronic music, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those would probably be my top, uh, top inspirations and, uh, influencers in the music yeah. scene today. And would you say that your sound has changed since you started producing music? Um, yeah, definitely. Because uh, when I first started producing music, um, it, it didn't have to do with electronic music at all. Um, I would produce uh, just simple acoustic covers, originals. Um, me and my two best friends, we had kind of like an indie rock band for a little <laughs> bit. And uh, we recorded a couple of uh, a couple of songs that was, uh, you know, we really didn't know much about production, but we had a friend who had a studio. So we went in and played live and started uh, started making a couple of songs and cut a couple, cut a couple records and so that was fun but um, you know when I first was getting into electronic music it was it was very much not necessarily loop based but it was very much uh, grid oriented like these segments are gonna go here and then this is gonna come in and then mm -hmm. this sound is gonna go here and then this is gonna change here so it was like a, it was like a puzzle and um, uh, I kind of got lost in like trying to worry about everything being structured and planned out and uh, wouldn't let the just the creative aspect of it flow and so uh, over time I got back into how about you just write good music <laughs> <laughs> forget about Record the rest it. yeah forget about the rest just worry about writing good music and uh, you know the rest will fall into place and so that's that's definitely happened and I don't know. I, as far as like a particular sound, I don't necessarily think that um, I have a signature or a unique sound, um, which kind of sucks in one aspect, but at the other time, it's kind of a good thing um, because you know, if you think about Skrillex, he's got a sound. You know, mm -hmm. if you think about Calvin Harris, he's got a sound. Everybody has a signature sound, and um, I think that's just something that 
just kind of develops over an extended amount of time when you see what you put out and what people respond to and what works. And because the scene is constantly changing. Like a year ago, people were very much about dubstep and like heavy electronic um, electro. And then all of a sudden, you know, Deep House was underground. Yeah. And now, you know, all, all of the hipsters are like, oh, I'm Ooh, about Deep it's House this now. new thing. Like, yeah. and what then, is this? And then, and then Future House comes out. And it's like, so the constant like shift, you're always, you're always trying to play the guessing game of what is the next sound going to be? And um, how can I adapt to that before it happens? Because, you know, once Future House came out, everybody was like making Future House tracks. And it's like, once it comes out, it's too late. You're not gonna make your break with this unique sound once it's already out. You know, then you're just, you're just copying, you know. The common phrase when people are starting to produce is um, copy the best and forget the rest. But if you're copying stuff that's already coming out, you're not going to have any originality and you're not going to be able to create your own sound. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's always like, you know, trying to play the guessing game, stay ahead of the curve. And um, as long as you're trying to constantly create uh, n something new, unique and interesting, um, then, you know, people, people will like it. It has to be different enough for people to be intrigued but similar enough for them to want to move to it because it reminds them of something they already like yeah which is hard <laughs> <laughs> it's tough it's tough playing that guessing game yeah and so i i know i read that you had attended as well as performed at events like edc so can you tell us a little bit more about that <laughs> yeah um well it's it's funny my my very first festival i ever attended um, I, I didn't get out much <laughs> when I was younger. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't until <laughs> later in life that uh, that I started going to music festivals and to shows and concerts and events and stuff. And so my first um, festival at all, any type of festival, was EDC in 2010. The last year it was at the uh, Coliseum in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. And um, I was supposed to meet up with friends, but um, cell reception was like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Been there, done you that. You shall try. You shall try, and you shall not succeed. So I ended up going to the uh, the event both days completely solo, and um, I thought it was going to be like super intimidating, and I thought I was going to you know get lost, like be confused, not want know where to go. I probably only knew maybe like five acts on the lineup because. Um, I wasn't really into what mainstream electronic music was at the time mm -hmm. and um, just who was popular and I, I knew the, the heavy hitters, I knew the big names, um, but you know, it's, it's actually one of the most liberating things going to a festival completely alone. Um, I wouldn't suggest doing it for, you know, a female just because of safety reasons, but <laughs> you know, for, for a single guy to go to a festival by, by yourself. And just to constantly be pulled whichever direction you get pulled because of what you hear and what music or experience or visuals you see that captures your attention. It's really, really nice. Um, yeah, I mean, I met some amazing, amazing people and like you always do at festivals. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, I met what would end up being my rave parents, as they <laughs> call themselves. It was really cute. I met a I met a really cool couple, um, Tim and Stephanie, uh, that basically they found out it was my first rave, my first music festival, and um, they're like, "Wow, you you need to hang out with us the entire time." I was like, "Okay, sure, why not?" <laughs> and they they took me around, showed me all their favorite artists. Um, we met up the following day, and we spent the second day together, and uh, and then I didn't see them for. Uh, two years. They, they live up in the Bay Area in San Francisco. And um, I've, I've, I don't know how it's happened, but I've made it a, a routine now to go to EDC every other year. So in 2012, um, I went to EDC in Vegas. And uh, my friends just went off in different directions. They were like, we're missing this person. We gotta go. And, you know, when you one person starts running through a crowd, it's difficult for the rest of the line to to keep up, but, um, so I ended up losing them, Again. and I found myself in a, in a similar situation. Maybe on where, purpose. Um, <laughs> well, 
<laughs> no, they, they were great. I wanted to see who they were going to, but I was like, well, I'm not going to try and, uh, you know, bust through this crowd to keep up with them because that's not safe. So I was just like, well, you know, if I find them, I find them. If not, oh, well, I did it, you know, two years ago by myself. I could do it again. And uh, I was walking through the food court and who do I end up randomly seeing within the hundreds of thousands of people Mom, that are there? Dad. <laughs> yeah. I, I seriously, I, I, I stopped for a second because I didn't want to be that person who like yells out some random person's name, <laughs> just like, oh, oh no, sorry, you look like somebody I know. But I yell out, Tim, Steph, and they both turn around and we had that, you know, rave reunion where you run from opposite ends and jump on each other and it, like the odds of that happening were so, so minuscule that it completely blew my mind. So once again, spent most of UDC together with them. And then um, didn't go in 2013. And uh, 2014 rolls around and uh, me and my friends have been doing a lot more in the production scene and in DJing. And we end up having uh, a couple of friends who were working on an art installation. And um, there was this big, big tent that was um, all black light uh, art inside. So you'd walk in and you were handed these 3D glasses and uh, black light art with 3D glasses is really, really mm -hmm. cool. It really messes with your depth perception. The ground was covered in um, black carpet and there were like bullseye targets that were like painted on the ground and like stars and constellations and planets on the ceiling. Yeah. So you walk in and you literally feel like you're in space because the floor looks like it's gone from beneath you, the ceilings and the walls. It was very disorienting, but really cool and the art was amazing. Um, we found out that they were going to be having a, uh, a little stage outside for the electric koi pond. So um, they contacted me and asked if I uh, wanted to play a set <laughs> at, yeah, at EDC. Uh, duh. <laughs> I, 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 I thought about it for a, probably a total of like 0. 0.2 seconds. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't want to seem too eager. And because uh, there, there are a lot of people that, you know, I'm sure were, were gunning for, for a set time just, you know, to have that experience. So um, I played there, and um, they ended up doing a similar uh, art installation at uh, Nocturnal Wonderland in San Bernardino, um, which was really cool. Uh, it was the first time that Noc was a uh, overnight camping festival. Mm -hmm. So that was an experience, because it was really hot. <laughs> so the camping, the camping part kind of sucked, but... Um, <laughs> We were there a couple of days before helping set up the stage. I actually ended up wiring and uh, being the sound engineer for the uh, for the entire stage, set up the whole sound system and everything. And then um, I DJed uh, both days for Nocturnal. Um, I think it was uh, Friday night at like 10 or 11 p.m. And then uh, Saturday evening, like at five or six, like right at sunset. So yeah. it, was, it was really cool. Great experience, had a lot of fun. Um, one of the best part, honestly, is just having an artist pass and being able to like go back into the like backstage of the <laughs> uh, the trailer area and hang out with um, a lot of the different artists. Um, met Jaws, hung out with Jaws. Uh, met Rehab, who's actually one of my favorite <laughs> one of my favorite mm -hmm. DJs. He's been doing a lot of really cool stuff. I've been into his music a long time, um, so that was really cool. Met Bear, it was awesome, and uh, yeah, being able to take my camera everywhere and just capture moments that you don't normally get to see um, at a festival when you're just an attendee uh, was was really entertaining and exciting for me. Mm -hmm. I love that story, like, um, especially like the first time you were at EDC. That was actually my first festival ever as well. Yeah. And I, nice. I listened to the music, but I never like been about the festival scene or never really knew about it or cared too much for it until my brother just got my ticket one year. And when I got there, I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. It was just like mind blown. And I've never gone to a yep. festival entirely by myself, but usually when I get there, I tend to just break away from my friends and roam because yep. a lot of times they try to go to like the main stage or into the crowd, whereas I just want to explore and meet yep. new people and like, you know, make new friends. and. It's it's been a festival that I've gone to every single year, actually, ever since. So that's impressive. Good job. <laughs> so if there was one festival that you could perform at, which one would be at the top of your list? 
Uh, all of them. <laughs> no, um, EDC, EDC was amazing. And, uh, the nice thing about performing at a festival, uh, multiple times or different styles, um, is every stage that you perform on is going to be different because the production level and value of each stage is always going to vary. Um, you know, you could play the mega structure one year and then the next year play the main stage and have a completely different experience. Um, but I, I definitely would love to be able to play multiple styles of, of festivals. I'm, a, I'm originally from the Palm Springs area, so uh, Coachella has been a big part of my life, um, attending it many years. And um, an artist who recently has played multiple styles uh, would be Kaiza. And at Coachella, she played a very indie, hipster, rock kind of set. Mm -hmm. And then um, she also performed at EDC the same year and was like full-blown electronic style and it was really cool to see that she has that versatility and that mm -hmm. um that capability so um i definitely would love to play coachella um one of my favorite you know, festivals the, the mass is uh you know tomorrowland <laughs> would be great <laughs> you know i would love to do some uh, some european festivals mm -hmm. as well and uh i've actually never been to a hard event so um, I think it would be really cool to, uh, if the first hard event I went to was one that I was playing, um, I really only kind of dabbled with, uh, with Insomniac and, and Coachella and Golden Voice and yeah. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I think I went to um, Hard Day of the Dead, I think Halloween mm -hmm. one year. It was a pretty good yeah. event. Definitely very different. I think it's more focused, less focused on production right mm -hmm. and like just like the whole experience and i think more a little bit more on the music cool yeah yeah i've, I've been really wanting to go to a uh, to a halloween festival i've never i'm always wor working on mm -hmm. halloween i've been doing um these big parties in the palm springs area um for the past like six years and every halloween like it's halloween weekend it always ends up the parties that are being thrown yeah, yeah. They'll, be, they'll pull like three to five thousand people but they'll uh they'll be at the same weekend as all the big halloween festivals so one of these days i'll be able to uh, i'll get it around to i'll get around to it i'm yeah. actually going to be spending this uh this halloween um in paris Ooh. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Well, not too yeah. shabby then. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's going to be really neat. Um, uh, I ended up getting a hotel like a half mile from the Moulin Rouge. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to uh, see what's going to be going on as far as Halloween goes there. I don't, I'm not really sure what goes down in Paris for Halloween. I know in Italy, Halloween is like a pretty big thing. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a lot of parties that are happening. But uh, I have to, I got to go find something something cool to do for halloween in paris i mean there's, there's got to be something that's going to be crazy going on yeah keep us posted are you gonna dress up um i didn't bring any costume stuff so i might have to make something <laughs> but uh who knows who knows I, I i brought a suit so i have i have a royal blue suit with me mm -hmm. i don't know how i can convert that into a costume but i mean i always anytime i'm like going to to a, a nice party i love the opportunity to, to suit up and so um if i don't end up going as like a hobo or <laughs> something that can be made something that can be made with like pizza boxes i'm pretty sure i have a bunch of pizza boxes lying around here um how's the pizza i might how's maybe the pizza? change one. Oh my god pizza <laughs> is definitely like the thing that i've had the most out here uh -huh. for sure it's just made differently like you don't get a slice of pizza you you get a pizza to mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like there's no shame involved in it like you <laughs> sit down you order your own pizza and you know it's it's you you consume the whole thing mm -hmm. in a sitting and uh i'm definitely gonna miss that especially <laughs> the, the especially the non-judgmental aspect of it because <laughs> i mean if you kill an entire pizza to yourself in the states people look at you a little funny <laughs> Here it's kind of expected. They're like, you didn't, you didn't finish. Are you not hungry? Was it not good? Was it not good? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So fortunately, uh, my little sister, she actually learned how to uh, uh, make the pizza from scratch. 
So she went over to a friend's house and they were making pizza from scratch. So she's, she's going to teach me how to make it. That way I want to get back home. I can, uh, you know, astound friends and family, loved ones with uh, <laughs> pizza making skills. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully. Um, so we want to get into some, a little bit more of the personal questions about you before we mm. make you sing and dance and do all this other crazy oh, stuff. God. So, <laughs> so um, first is what else do you like to do aside from, you know, your, your typical like producing music and dancing and what are some of your other hobbies? I mean, that's pretty much it. No, <laughs> um, uh, I've, I've. I haven't done it in a while, but um, I, I grew up with uh, a big appreciation for ceramics, oddly enough, and um, it was related to music. Uh, it was related to music in the sense that I would um, throw on the wheel, I was a potter, and I would uh, throw ceramic drums and then put them together, glaze them, uh, get calf skin and put it on top and I was just making a bunch of musical instruments you know you can make interesting flute type instruments with ceramics and so I still enjoy doing that um I recently started YouTubing a bit mm -hmm. um I want to uh kind of incorporate YouTube as part of the brand and everything and uh I got into it because um I was working with a couple of uh already like really well established YouTube artists um Leah Marie Johnson uh, Madeline Bailey, uh, a guy named Golden, um, really big names, and they have like you know millions of followers and mm -hmm. stuff. And uh, they brought me in to help arrange and write some of the music and uh, perform and play in their videos. And um, that actually led to me performing at VidCon this last year uh, in Anaheim mm -hmm. with Leah Marie Johnson. So uh, just those couple experiences, you know, kind of really got me into. Uh, the idea of pushing YouTube more for myself. So, um, and then also the fact that I was working for a uh, TV and film producer for uh, six months and just kind of like getting a, a background insight on what that life is like, um, video production, uh, just movie and TV production in general, that, you know, piqued my interests and, and kind of got me back into, into filmmaking. So, um, yeah. Uh, I can sew and uh -huh. <laughs> crochet. I, I can sew and crochet. Um, you know, my mom was very big on uh, on having certain skills growing up, and um, the crocheting is definitely you know taught, grandmother taught, uh, you know, cultural hand hand me down type of uh, experiences. But um, it's always nice not having to uh, or knowing how to you know sew re sew on a button. You know, if something pops off of my collar or something like just being able to fix stuff like that. But um, it's not something that I practice regularly <laughs> or that I like do often. But if I need to, you know, I can hem some pants and, you know, I've uh, I actually helped um, teach a fashion design course this last summer up in uh, up in Idlewild, which was a lot of fun. You know, the kids were making uh, patchwork denim projects and dresses and all kinds of cool stuff. But uh, as far as hobbies, basically anything related to performing arts is mm -hmm. what I spend most of my time in. I mean, I do dabble in some video game playing okay. from time to time. <laughs> it's more of it's more of an escape, you know. Like when I don't, when I can't really focus and think on music, uh, it's it's good to kill zombies every once in a while, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And uh, I, I think that might be a little bit more of like maybe the training aspect, you know, just in case the zombie apocalypse hits. Okay, you know. which it could be possible. It's possible. I mean, I'm not ruling anything <laughs> out. I'm not ruling anything out. The apocalypse can happen in many different ways. So I don't know. I think I think Call of Duty is definitely a, a bit of a <laughs> end of the world training program. But um, you know, and then of course Netflix binging. That's always. That's always, I, I wouldn't call it a hobby. It's more of a dedicated so, commitment. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like. Every now and then you just need to have that, right? Yeah, yeah. Especially uh, when when I wasn't working uh, for Jerry Weintraub anymore. I probably took about a week to catch up on like five or six shows that I was. What, what shows? What shows do you watch? Oh, oh man. Um, well, 
The Walking Dead, obviously. obviously. That's been have like to. everyone's answer. <laughs> have to, have to. Um, Fear the Walking Dead, I think, mm -hmm. is very important, and a lot of people should watch it, especially if you live in LA, okay. because it is LA based, and it gives you a very interesting idea of if something does happen, not necessarily zombie apocalypse, but if there is some form of, you know, city shutdown and they have to do quarantines and street blockage and stuff, it's really nice to um, have that situation just presented in front of you so you can kind of think about what would you do in some type of disaster situation whether it's you know earthquake power grid goes down like it's good for people to be prepared mm -hmm. water food basics and stuff like that but um other tv shows uh i I'm, I'm a comic fan i like i like um tv shows if they're done well that are based off of comics so uh the arrow um the flash mm -hmm. um I've, I've always loved detective type shows. Um, I Have recently you watched started. Gotham? Love Gotham, yes. Um, unfortunately, Netflix and Hulu don't work in Italy, so I've had to go on to like, different websites in order to find <laughs> like ways to stream and download. Oh, wow. It just started downpouring outside. I hear that. <laughs> yeah, no, like, mad thunderclaps. <laughs> That got intense for a quick. I know, I heard that. I was like, did something fall? No, no, that that just, it, the sky's just opened up right now. Um, yeah, big fan of Gotham. Um, it's nice to see where they kind of went with the whole concept of doing the prequel idea. Like the entire series is set up around uh, Jim Gordon and Brie as a kid versus, you know, Batman yeah. as as being the main character, so that's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, detective shows. I recently started watching a show called Rizzoli and Isles, mm -hmm. which uh, my sister got me into. I had never heard of it before, but um, it has uh, one of the main detectives from like Law and Order, the really attractive brunette female. Mm -hmm. um, she's one of the main characters in it, so I recognized her and was like, oh, okay, I'll check what this show's <laughs> about. And it's you know it's your typical you know murder homicide detective show. It's, starts getting you thinking you could be a detective and you start like looking at things differently you're like hmm, if i wanted to commit a crime i'm like how would they get my forensic evidence and like the dna's and like you know so no crime's bad don't don't commit crimes. <laughs> terrible but yeah so i mean that that's kind of that's that's my jam i mean i really enjoyed uh, how i met your mother yeah i i think i watched I kinda, all of that at one point not anymore, but a long time ago, I watched all those. <laughs> I think I watched like the entire series in a month. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was that was one of my solid binge watching. I got really into that show, and then I got really sad and depressed when it was over because mm -hmm. I felt like I wasn't going to be able to like hang out with my friends anymore or something. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was bad. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I was, I don't really watch TV. It's all like streamable stuff. I don't. I never really had cable as a kid growing up. So once uh, TV shows started becoming streamable or were on Netflix or whatever, that was really only the time I, the only time I got into actual like television programs. Mm -hmm. You know, people will constantly ask, are you watching this? Are you watching this? And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm same sorry. I've, I've never seen a single episode of Breaking Bad. On TV. <laughs> sorry. No, I've, I've, never, I've never seen one episode at all oh, of Breaking Bad. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, same. Um, I mean, I'll, me too, but people always talk about it, but I just, I don't really have time for that, so I'm just like, every now and then if you're exactly. on Hulu, you might watch like an episode or two, but I'm not like, it's nine o'clock, let me watch this show, like, yeah. Right, right. The only shows I'm like actually committed like that would probably have to be uh, The Walking Dead, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know, I, re I really enjoyed watching American Ninja Warrior for a while when it was, when it was on. American Ninja Warrior was mm -hmm. uh, very entertaining. Never heard of that. Have you seen it? Uh-uh. You've never seen American no. Ninja Warrior. Uh -uh. It's a, uh, it's kind of like a fitness obstacle course challenge program. Uh, they set up different things in different cities, uh, different obstacle courses that you got to go through, and it's all you know strength, balance, speed, endurance uh, obstacles, and um, they, I mean, they hold them in Venice Beach. One of them is in Venice Beach. The the finals or whatever are in uh, Las Vegas. And uh, it's just really, really impressive to see what people are actually physically capable of doing. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's also motivating as well. So you you feel really crappy when you finish <laughs> watching a show and you're, you're like, sitting uh... on the couch. <laughs> like, do you want, do you want to go jogging or something? <laughs> like, should feel like we should be doing some push-ups, like, during commercial breaks. I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, it's good to have that, that motivation. You you want to go to the gym after yeah. after watching that show. So that's that's also a good yeah. one, too. I like those. Okay. Um, so just a couple more questions. Um, first one is, if you can go back in time and meet anybody, who would that be? Anybody. That's, that's tough. I mean, like any point in time? Like any point in time. Jeez Louise. Um, You're like, get me out of that. <laughs> yeah, the thunder is getting intense. Uh, I mean, it's it's kind of weird, but like some of the classics. I mean, Shakespeare, for sure. Um, classic composers, you know, Beethoven, Mozart would be incredible um, to to meet and just kind of pick their brains. Um, Michael Jackson, man, I, I really thought one day I was going to be able to see him perform live in person and you know if if by some miracle was able to meet him that would have been huge um huge for me uh i don't know i mean there's always like the historic figures that would be cool Mm -hmm. but um you know i said one (laughs) but you already have five i'm I'm terrible i'm terrible at that yeah it's it's hard to narrow stuff down no more okay yeah so those those are michael jackson (laughs) those are are my five we'll we'll just we'll just settle on michael jackson that'll be yeah that would be the one for there. Yeah. And, you know, if there's something that you really value, something that either, whether it's an object or just an idea, what's something that you would like to pass on to, you know, your kids or future generations? Um, actually, I think it's something that uh, is becoming really more popular in in today's society, in um, in the millennials and like our generation, is um, positivity. Just not only like constantly putting it out yourself, but um, having positive thoughts about yourself and um, self empowerment. And uh, just if you're constantly being a positive person, even if you don't necessarily believe it, even if you're faking it, and you force yourself, you know, to smile. At people you know you you trick your body into believing it's happy and um, I, I'm very big on uh, the power of choice um, mm-hmm. I've talked about it and like if all my friends who have known me for a long period of time know that uh, yeah the power of choice to me in my mind is is it's an incredible thing um, the human brain in general is just incredibly powerful and uh, you know Every day we're, we're presented with obstacles and difficulties and, and um, instead of thinking of them as obstacles or difficulties, if you think of them as opportunities um, to make a choice to be better or be happier mm-hmm. uh, than you currently are, um, the constant change that is happening in the world will veer from being a change to the negative to a change to the positive. So uh, me and my close group of friends, uh, we have this saying um, about being pop, and um, pop music in general is always like happy, uplifting. You know, you're going out with your friends, you know, you're falling in love. Like you don't you don't hear too many pop songs that are, are like down and sad. Yeah. Um, pop music is generally a really happy thing, and um, you know, so we always constantly remind each other to to always be pop to always go pop and um, to be a positive influence on other people around you because, you know, they say opposites attract, but it's definitely way more common that happy, positive people surround themselves with other happy, positive people. Mm -hmm. And if you continue to just put that out, that that's what you're going to get back in return. And you can't, you can't surround yourself with, with any form of negativity. If there's something that's negative in your life, Get rid of it. Change it. Make a choice because you have the power to do so. You can mm-hmm. choose what you surround yourself with. You can choose, you know, how you're going to react to a situation. You know, a lot of the times people will let emotions get the best of them. And, you know, if they are in an argument, there's the blame game that's played and they throw it out there. When in actuality, if you take accountability and you just 
make a choice to control your actions, control your emotions, the things that you say, you can make a difference, not only in your life, but in other people's lives. So to constantly um, be a positive influence on everyone around you is probably what I would hope is the thing that I can portray, not only to like my friends and family or kids or whatever, but um, I want it to be what my music and my career and my whole brand and idea uh, uh, about myself is, is constantly um, empowering yourself and being positive and just constantly putting positivity out in the world. That way, you know, if, uh, if you change one person's life for the better, you know, that's, that's one better thing in the world. If everybody did that, you know? Yeah. I love, love, love that answer. <laughs> Um, and I think that's one of the things that attracted me to you because I think we only kind of like, maybe I followed you on Instagram or something and yeah. your posts were always like, do this, do that, <laughs> like positive, like you can do anything. Like, I don't, I remember now that you mentioned that I didn't even remember before getting on this call today because it had been mm -hmm. a while since I followed some of your posts. Um, you know, knew that you were a producer DJ in the LA area and we had exchanged a couple messages. But now that you're saying all of this, it clicked with me that that's yeah. what attracted me to you. And I mean, I love that whole part about what you said because we're all presented with challenges, right? Or obstacles. You either grunt about it and like, oh, this happened to me, or you try to figure out the solution, right? It's not about the problem, it's about how you're going to mm -hmm. overcome that and the decisions that you make. I, I like to just smile at random people. Like anytime <laughs> I'm going anywhere, I, I, people think I'm crazy because I'll sit on the bus <laughs> out here and I'll just I'll just look down the line and try and like make eye contact with people and smile with them, at them, you know? Because I, I think personally, it's always best to be the first to smile at somebody as opposed to the person who didn't smile back. Mm -hmm. Like. Like, it's always better because you never know. Like, you don't know what that person's going through. Everybody has their own battles that they're dealing with on a daily basis. And just being seen and acknowledged by somebody and having that person just genuinely smile at you can turn somebody's day completely around. So, yeah, I think positive output <laughs> is the yeah. best way to receive positivity and, and just feel better about yourself, about your life, about you know, the most of the time sad world that, that we live in, you know, the only way that we can, uh, that we can make a change in our world is to change our world. Mm -hmm. And if you're not going to change it for the better, then you're just going to be more cause of the negative things of it. So just be positive, be happy and don't take anything for granted. Yeah. I saw another really good, uh, uh, it was actually a checklist, you know, of, um, something that a mother was, um, common things that she would complain about, you know, having to do dishes, the fact that you're able to have consistent meals uh -huh. every day, you know, having to do laundry, the fact that you have clothes that you can wear, mm -hmm. you know, um, and it just went through all the things that you would like gripe about, complain about chores that you'd have to do and the actual like blessings that, you know, that we take for granted, you know, being in a country that is very well off, so to speak, you know, if more people cared more about other people besides them, mm -hmm. that uh, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's the whole golden rule thing. Yeah. You know, treat others the way you want to be treated. If you put other people ahead of yourselves, ahead of your own needs, then, then you're probably going to be well off because you're going to make friends and people who are going to love you for constantly being that kind, compassionate, caring person. And if you hit a hard point in your life, we're going to be there to help pick you up because of the influence that you've had on them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, you, you, you get what you put out, you know, what goes around comes around. And, uh, for, for me right now, if, uh, if I could be, you know, remembered for one thing, just like in my life, in my career, whatever the case may be, like, I don't necessarily want it to be about music or being about getting famous or DJing or anything like that. I just, I really want people to, um, remember like kindness and compassion uh that's really the only thing that i care about it's crazy <laughs> well said <laughs> well said 
Um, yeah, that's that's a great answer, and um, that's what we'll leave off with here. Um, but before we let you go, uh -oh. um, we want you to, you know, do something. <laughs> oh, Whether it's with the instrument, some dancing, some singing, whatever you want to share with us, we'd like to leave with that. Okay. After um, that very emotional, touching <laughs> answer, we want to just leave it lighthearted. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll let me grab my guitar. Real quick. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I actually bought this guitar in Italy, oh. and I was super stoked to get it because I wanted the thing to play when I was here, and um, I don't know if it's in tune or anything. Um, ah, oh, jeez, what if I... Trying to think of stuff that I've been working on recently. <laughs> I know, right? We we didn't we didn't talk about going over and like doing performance stuff. <laughs> I know, I like surprises. Let's see here. Um, I'm a big uh, Sam Smith fan. Ooh, I think too. he's got an amazing voice. Uh -huh. And um, I just started. I knew this song on uh, on piano. I learned it on piano, and like. Two days ago, I decided that I was going to learn it on guitar because I didn't have a piano here. <laughs> so um, I, I will probably mess it up, but I'll do like a verse and a chorus okay. of, of this. Let's hear it. Gosh, it. man, the nerves <laughs> make me so nervous now. Okay. <laughs> yes, I do. I believe one day I will be where I was right there, right next to you. And it's hard. Days just seem so dark. The moon, the stars, I'm nothing without you. Your one touch, your skin, where do I begin? No words can explain the way I'm missing you. Deny this emptiness, this hole that I'm inside. These tears, they tell their own story. You told me not to cry when you were gone. The feeling's overwhelming, it's much too strong Can I lay by your side Next to you You And make sure you're all right I'll take care of you And I don't want to be here if I can't be with you tonight <laughs> Alright <laughs> That was beautiful Ah, oh, thanks That's awesome And you just learned that two days ago on that? Yeah, yeah. I I didn't want to go into the next part because it like the chord changes get all crazy. Yeah. It's, it's it's difficult to to remember the progression and then also sing along to it because mm -hmm. Sam Smith has just got the yeah. most ridiculous That's runs wonderful. and range and everything. But yeah. All right. Well, before we let you go, um, any last words for your listeners, your fans, and how they can connect with you? Um. Yeah. I uh, actually, um, if you guys already follow me on SoundCloud and Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all that other social media stuff, um, all of my handles are the same. So whatever the website is, facebook.com forward slash Cesare, it's C3ASARE. Um, same thing with Twitter, mm -hmm. Instagram, SoundCloud, all the handles are the same. Um, I just finished uh, a remix for uh, a Cascade track, mm -hmm. uh, Disarm You. Ooh. And uh, I'm actually really excited about it because it is the first uh, festival trap, kind of like heaven trap remix that Ooh. I've worked on. 
So I'm stoked to release that. That'll probably be coming out in a couple of weeks, sometime maybe early November. And um, I also recently worked on a, uh, a major laser track called mm -hmm. Too Original. Mm -hmm. And uh, that one was really fun. I kind of got into a little bit of a 1920s, uh, like jazzy ragtime kind of vibe with it. And so uh, that'll be coming out probably in the middle of November. Um, I think Instagram and Facebook are like the things that I'm most active on. So if you want to like get a hold of me through that, I'm always down to message people back. I'm always down to collaborate with people. Um, I'm currently looking for some uh, singer songwriters to uh, put some lyrics to some original tracks that I've been producing. Mm -hmm. So if anybody out there is interested in that, always hit me up and um, see if we can possibly work together. Yeah. And if I come out to New York at any given time, I don't know how long you're going to be in New York, but we need to meet up and yeah. grab some coffee or something. <laughs> well, I'll be here or back in, um, I'm headed home, San Francisco, and for Thanksgiving, and then I'm headed down to um, LA so oh, for, cool. for Dream State. So I might catch you there if you're back home. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I'll be back in New, uh, New York for the New Year's and beyond. Perfect. All right. Well, when you're when you're in LA, we'll we'll meet up because I'll be back out there at that time. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Um, you know, I hope you enjoy the rest of your trip. You have another uh, what twenty uh, something days left? Twenty twenty six days. Yeah. yeah. I'll be in Paris for five days, um, October thirtieth through November fourth, and then I leave back for the states November 9th. So I'll be back out in uh, the Palm Springs area for a couple days, and then back out to LA. Awesome. Well, we'll all be sure to follow you on your Instagram and your Facebook. You got a lot of awesome pictures going on there. And <laughs> uh, we're excited to check out all the new music and projects you have coming out. Thank you so much. Thanks.